Viva in the Gutters, episode 104. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning, the discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Ravine, Volume 1 and 2, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 114.29. Alright, we ready to start? Yeah, I'm I'm rolling. We're going. Episode 104. Beef in the gutters. I'm Andrew Chard. I'm Tobias Panchin. I'm Kaylee Fleeman. Brant Gillahan Eddy. And I'm Ked Reynolds. Yeah. And uh, we're talking about what are we talking about today? We're talking about Ravine. That's right. You pitched this. I, I did. did not remember that. I don't know. You remember the episode number, but you can't remember what you, know, you pitched. It's been a long week. <laughs> um, it has Chard's only capable of retaining one piece of episodic information at any given time. Either That's, it's the episode, the episode number, or the issue. It's a hundred percent accurate. <laughs> or my name. No more than that. Well, no, then that's two. Oh, because okay. you always remember your name. Do you? Always so far, you have. <laughs> It's you not a question. Go, I, Andrew so there will be one episode where he's like, it's episode one, uh, well, you know, whatever. It's this issue. And I don't remember who I am. <laughs> that might happen. And we'll know that the cog has slipped just a yeah. little too much. I don't know who I am or any of you people are, but let's talk about comic books anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. No, you, uh, you pitched. Reading, I did. Chard. Yeah. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I reread it. Um, so this is going to be weird because I'm going to reference an episode that is not yet released for Out of the Fridge because I already talked about this on Out of the Fridge and a lot of my opinions still stand, but I'll kind of walk through. Like, I still really feel like a good chunk of the beginning of this book is Mystic Babble and it's still like yeah. get through that quickly yeah. because th- then you can actually get to where it's a comic book and a story. Yeah. I still find that frustrating. The second time reading it though, it was nice because I had a little bit of context for who these people are and what they're doing. We talk a lot about kind of the narrative style of just throwing you into the middle of something and normally I really really love that. But I I have a harder time with it in fantasy because you have nothing to grab onto, right? You're like, where is this? What is this? Who is that? Is that a bad guy? What's going on? Like, you just don't know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, in, in fantasy generally, in this specific kind of fantasy, which I'll get into more in a bit, mm-hmm. um, throwing somebody into the middle of things and just throwing random like nouns that have no context yeah. to them is, can be really frustrating. That's exactly what mm-hmm. I mean when I say Mystic Babble. It's just like proper noun, proper noun thing type of magic proper noun you're like i'm lost i'm completely lost i have no idea what's going on and that, that neck right has a grim loss <laughs> you're like, I, well, I don't know it's this literally the same reason why i like playing uh like uh tabletop rpgs of things i know what they are rather mm-hmm. than playing D because if someone's like you walk into a room and there's 10 stormtroopers i'm like i know what those are and i'm ready to go <laughs> but if you say anything from D, i'm like i have no i don't know what's happening who am i what's going on <laughs> i get very like confused the wizard lich and his 10 goblin lackeys yeah like, uh, well it's not even it's like the ones that get reused i'm okay with but it's like I don't know. A it, boulette it took me a long uh, erupts time. from the ground and begins assaulting your group. And I like, saw a bo- just, just call it a land shark. That's right. I saw a, a beholder way before I knew what it was because it was on the cover of uh, the Super Nintendo Dungeons and Dragons game. But yes. I did not know what it was called for many years. So it's like that. If you were like, and the beholder, I'd be like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> was that Eye of the Beholder? Uh, the game? Yeah. Well, probably. Because I, I had that for the PC. It was yeah. awesome. I think Never it, beat it. I think it was on Super Nintendo. Maybe I'm thinking of a different D&D game, but it, it, there was a Beholder on the cover of a, a game. I remember I'm presuming that. that it was Eye of the Beholder. Um, probably. That sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I have a really hard time with the beginning of this book. I like it once it gets going a lot. And when it gets to the second volume, I feel like it really like starts to come into its own as far as like an actual narrative. And uh, I like the characters and that stuff a lot more than what's going on at the beginning i still really like the magic the gathering card art art it is a little static for my taste sometimes i actually had a little bit of a bone to pick with you about that why because we had this entire argument last week about how the art in the wicked and the vine yeah in your opinion was like photorealistic and that like took you out of the story it's the lack of detail 
and th- in my mind, like this book has so much detail, so much ridiculous level of detail yeah. where you can see every single individual link in the chainmail yeah. armor. Like this looked photorealistic to me, yeah. and it really took me out of the story. Uh, well, I mean, I like knowing, especially in a story like this, where it's like I've never been to this world. Like I like knowing the textures of things, like the materials of stuff. Like if you were to cosplay a character from this book as opposed to cosplaying a character from Wicked in the Vine, you would know so much more about how their clothing is constructed and what it's made of and what it's supposed to look like than you would in the Wicked in the Vine. And I'm not saying that like all books should strive for that but i'm saying like if i have to imagine so much of what is going on and that it's not like presented like sometimes i find that to be i don't want to say lazy but just like you know that's not not as well thought out and that's fair but like reading this book i mean looking at this book Mm. there is so much going on in every single panel there's so much detail there's so many little features on all of these things a lot of it looks like cg well yeah it looks like cg like i have a hard time looking at it like a comic book page and like every single page is so busy like i have a hard time focusing on any one thing yeah i don't feel like i really have a sense of what's happening because my eye is not like it's not drawn in any one direction, and so it ends up going in every direction. I find, though, that he still uses a lot of the skills of guiding your eye that a lot of great artists use. In panels where it's supposed to be like a really striking moment between two characters, you'll notice that the background is just kind of like a washed-out like brush tone in the background, and that the lighting effect does a lot more to draw your attention to stuff in the scene, and it's like... Yeah, I could stare at the detail on his armor all day, but it's not as important as what's happening in the rest of the scene. So, like, naturally my eyes are drawn to the characters who are talking just because that's what the word balloons are pointing towards. So, I mean, I have a lot of the same problems with it that I have, not so much with the detail, but the static nature of how things are posed. The same that I have with, like, Alex Ross, where it's like, I like the way it looks, but it looks like stills from a film. And that is not static in some, like, that is not fluid and, and, like, it doesn't look like motion. It looks static. It looks like you just pushed pause. And it's hard, if you don't see what happens after what happens before, sometimes it's hard to, like, imagine that motion. So that's the biggest problem I think I have with the art is that sometimes there's just, like, these moments of, so what what exactly is happening right now? But I, I like the detail. I just, like... People complain about the Venture Brothers sometimes, mm-hmm. that they add too many jokes in an episode. And I'm like, how is that a complaint, though? It's like more content. And so I kind of feel the same way about people who are like, oh, Jeff Darrow's art is like too detailed. There's too much going on. And I'm like, why would you complain about that? Just read it more than just look at it longer. Like, it's just extra stuff. Well, there there is something to be said for white space in design or negative sure. space. Or that simplicity. You, that if you want something to have emphasis, you need to give it a little bit of time to breathe. Maybe. I mean, like, there are different schools. I mean, these, these are design fundamentals. Sure. And as far as, like, graphic design, like, I would totally agree with you. But as far as, like, how film is constructed and how, like, film has influenced this visual medium, there are films in which, like, it's a busy background. Like, it's busy for a reason. Like, it's supposed to be, like, Seven, for example, is, like, Everything that's going on in the background is very cluttered. Like, there's a lot of stuff in a lot of those scenes. And they use that to when later there is not a lot of stuff in the scene, the end of the movie. Like, it's you don't have anything else to look at but the main characters. That's like a bait and switch in that. I think the one difference here where I can see there being a challenge is that film is paced by itself and mm-hmm. you are self pacing this. Yeah. And so I think what happens is, and I ran into this a little bit with the introduction specifically where it's so many concepts and it's so busy Mm -hmm. and it's so much detail. It just kind of was like, whoa. And you're right. I did the same thing. And in a sense, you're right. Like you can take more time, but I wouldn't necessarily get mad at somebody if they were like, you know what? I started this. It was way too much for me. No, I I did the exact same thing. When I started reading this for out of the fridge, I was like, holy shit, this is going to be a long haul. And so when I had first started flipping through it and reading the few pages, I was like, all right, so I got to read two trades. This is going to take me like at least three, maybe four hours to read it if it's all this dense. And so I like allotted that much time and I finished it in like an hour and a half because once you get past that first initial like 
this is what the world like the that grind of the beginning it took mm-hmm. me like three days to read the first volume yeah and like three hours to read the second one really yeah that's insane i don't know i was just like i was so into it by the time we got out of the once she leaves uh what is it she she has a conversation with the woman with the like magical robot leg yeah like right after, after she after gets that the part. spear yeah well, while she's getting the spear, but like oh, it's right. it's the there's the part at the beginning where even the scene where you meet the other guy, the guy character with the weird hat, Stein. and he like marks the dragon. Yeah. So then there's the scene with her like getting the the ring, and then she walks the lady all the way back to the tower, and I was still like, oh my god. And then right after that, there's a dragon attack, and I was like, finally, finally, things are happening like fast. <laughs> yeah, no, it wasn't until after she got the spear and left the city yeah. that it actually started picking up for me story-wise. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a slow beginning like, of this book. I want, well, it's, it's not that it's slow so much as that there's just so much that yeah. is being thrown at you with yeah. no and context. this is why people stop reading books like wizard and glass if you've ever tried to read the dark tower series yeah. or the game of thrones books. or uh fellowship of the ring yeah yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. oh my god <laughs> yeah i mean like I, I can i totally understand that it's a valid complaint like i get it but for me it's like i would rather it have it look this busy and this detailed this much because i know i can go back and look at it later like i know i can enjoy more it, like it's it's the gift that keeps on giving or like, if I've read it and I go back and read it, I'm going to notice new details, new things. Well, new, it's like the Arrested Development. So maybe syndrome, it's like a know? different experience reading it in print. I was mm-hmm. reading it digitally. Me too. And as I was reading it, I was stopping on my iPad to just zoom in to panels <laughs> <laughs> and like zoom in. It's like how much detail did he? Oh my god, he drew that much detail, and yeah. it's like one little background element, like. Yeah. Definitely impressive. Yeah. Oh, impressive, certainly. And I, I want to point this out before I forget. Uh, one of our listeners, and I hope I'm not fucking his name up, uh, Andre, yeah. sent us a message on Facebook because he is Croatian. Yes. And the creator of this is also Croatian. And so he said the creator's name for us. And unless I'm in my terrible American accent horribly butchering what he was saying, his name is Stepan Sage. Oh. That's much easier than I thought it would right? be. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Stepan, like, I am 100% amazed yeah. at how good his art is. Yeah. Like, I love his artwork. I can't wait to see his first issue of Rat Queens. Mm-hmm. I still feel like this is overdone. Like, there's too much detail. There's too much stuff going on. <laughs> I... It's it's the same argument for me with the Venture Brothers, uh, though. I, is it's like yeah. I well, really I, can't seem to agree with either of you <laughs> here. It's like I'd rather there be stuff than there not be stuff. I guess so. My my biggest thing was that I really appreciated the detail. I felt like there were certain panels and scenes where it would have been better if he had left out some of the extra detail. Where mm. like maybe not made it so busy so that you could focus on those characters and kind of like what you're talking about with seven where like that the absence of background suddenly draws you into these characters and you have to look at them well he he does it, use that though uh, i but there are times where i think he doesn't use it to its full advantage he mm. could have used it more often you know like there were definitely times where I w- was trying to figure out what was going on or like reading and then i just kind of got caught up looking uh, the the citadel in the background. Yeah, you have scenes where like he's sitting in the cave talking to the guy in his magic weapons, and it's like a cave wall is the background. Like yeah, the, and it's yeah. an incredibly detailed cave wall. But it's with, like not, lots of. But why would you and, look at that? And because my eye is being drawn to it because there's <laughs> why, shit happening though? in the background. No, it's like, not. There's just that's all these rock. lines. That's what rocks look like. <laughs> Just in draw, a, just, in draw a gray, <laughs> just put a gray smear back there. Why? Like, okay, that's rocks. I don't have to look at that. <laughs> in the like out in the world, like I don't get distracted because like the bricks have so much detail. Like I just know not to look at the yeah, walls. Okay. But here's the thing: long. is that you're seeing in three dimensions. Yeah. I, so like you can tell what's foreground and what's background. When something is a flat two dimensional image, it all has the same weight. I can in that way. absolutely tell what's foreground and background in here because he uses Photoshop techniques to to use uh, depth of field to make the stuff in the background slightly out of focus. 
Like, he uses all the tools that a digital artist has to make it very clear what is supposed to be in focus and what's not in most scenes. There are some scenes, like battle scenes, where it's like, he kind of got a little carried away on that other guy's armor. But there'll be scenes like the dragon's attacking. The dragon has a lot of detail on him. There's like a, a catapult or something, that's, or a, a, like something that shoots arrows. What do you call those? Ballista. That. Um, is shooting at the dragon. That. <laughs> I just pointed at Kate very emphatically. Um, and the guys manning the ballista, their armor is like very simplistic. Like, he draws them very simply in right, that scene like, because that you're supposed scene, to like, focus on the dragon. I'm supposed to be focusing on the scene, and instead I'm like, wow, there's a lot of, like, texture detail on that dragon. Let me zoom in on his leg. Oh, my God, look at all the scales that he drew in. <laughs> See the texture of the leg? Like, that wow. Sound, that so you're like easily like distracted. That's yeah, that's it sounds like an ADHD thing there. Like, I, I get it. I, I totally uh, I'm, understand. I'm willing but... to do- let this be, a, like, a personal preference yes. thing. I think it is not only a personal preference. I think that is like you chose to look at the detail, and therefore it took you three hours to read it. Like you didn't have to look at that. I, see, I oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was just gonna say I'm kind of in both of your camps and neither of your camps because, like, I I feel like in some places there was not enough detail, but in others I feel there was too much. And the beginning of the book did really bog me down. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to retain the information for later, and I kept having to flip back and try to read I mean, stuff. I mean, and so, though, then again, it has a map in the book, just like Game of Thrones. So I'm going to start reading it yeah. like Game of Thrones. Oh, they mentioned this place. Flip back to the map and see where they are. And maybe this, this does have also, like, an awesome appendices with, like, a lot of great information about the yes. characters. So it's, like, it so helpful. I get it. Like, there's a lot of shit in this book. There's also a lot of stuff in Game of Thrones and a lot yeah. of stuff in Lord of the Rings and a lot of stuff in these. Yeah. And if you've ever read, like, a... Um, like a really dense like Russian novel or something with 800 characters like this is a lot e- more easily read than some of right, those I'm just going to give like, you one last example Okay all right we get it <laughs> No just I'm looking at for I'm one looking. second so I've got a random page here and yes. there's like a half page panel and there's a guy in the foreground and there's two people in the background and I zoom in on one of the people in the background and you can see every single chain link in her armor yeah. and all of the filigree and every little bit of the plate yeah. mail it and looks like, awesome. it's just it's too much detail. It's not there's no such thing. There, really there is, a, is that's like saying that man this this new Blu-ray and HD TV is really annoying because it's there's so much detail I don't know what to watch. Please give me back my VHS tapes. Like there's a there's a huge gulf of difference between film and graphic art. But I think that we should move on because I don't want to go down this fucking rat hole for the no, entire episode. And I and I get it and I totally I mean like I can see it but I, in my opinion it's like if they're going to put the detail in, if they're going to do the work, like this is the artist's intent is like, I want this book to look the best I can possibly make it look. I'm going to spend the time to make it look as good as it does. Yeah. And like, I think it does come down to each person's personal preference, yeah. what you are willing to give into it, what you are willing to put into it to take out of it. Yeah. I mean, and as like as concept art, as like a giant poster that I'm going to mm-hmm. put up in my wall. I think this is amazing. Yeah. As sequential art, I find it problematic. Yeah. It's like, to me, the, I mean, yeah, it, it's just a, it's a difference of opinions because everyone's going to have their own taste in art, and there is no right way to make sequential art, and there's no. Well, I would argue that there are more. In, there are good ways and bad ways. I feel like this is not as effective as it could be, and you you disagree, and that's that's okay. There's. This is where we get into my my feelings on good and bad uh and that like <laughs> putting weight on how someone does their craft is really detrimental to the craft itself is like you have people that write pop music that are looked down upon by people who compose like orchestral scores and be like ugh pop music but like it is as much an art form as theirs but i mean like how do you define what's good and what's bad well, that's, like, what, that's I've, why I'm, I've read, I'm trying to get away from yeah. the words good and bad. I'm trying to say effective and not effective. And I, like, I read Understanding Comics. I've read it. And there's a lot of things that I agree with the way he talks about how sequential art should work to make you read it effectively and how it works on your mind, like, as you read it. And there's a lot of it that I agree with. And there's some of it that I disagree with is, like, that's not the only way to do it. And I think that in the same way, while you may prefer the thing to be done in a specific way. It doesn't make it less effective for everyone else. 
yeah, if it's not should, done in that you way. You should always be trying to break the mold too. If you, yeah. even if you read about something like in about or uh understanding comics. Yeah. Or when you think about it in terms of video games, yeah. um in a sea of World of Warcraft, somebody creates Minecraft. Right. And it's just like completely different, but yeah. you need to keep doing it as an artist. You need to keep seeing what works, what doesn't. And what I and like everyone's kind of going to have their own opinion about what's effective and not effective and like I find there to be like really ineffective video games that exist in the world today and I'm like this is not an effective video game and yet it sells like a million copies, like 10 million, 30 million copies. And I'm like, well, clearly that's just my opinion and that I'm in a minority there. Well, I like, mean, to bring it back to comics, I'm sorry, I'm staring at the uh, wall behind Toby and like, there's definitely art that I like, and there's definitely art that I don't like, and I come back to, um, what was the book by, who's the writer and uh, artist for Scott Pilgrim? Uh, oh, uh, Brian O'Malley. 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 Yeah, Brian Lee O'Malley. Yeah, I don't like his stuff. Like, I know why people like it. Yeah. I know what, you know, but like, I don't find it effective in any way, and most of the time I find it, blah, 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 it makes me mad, I don't know. Yeah. So, like, I get it, both. But, and, and I think everybody in this room has a different... Oh sure, one of those. Well, can I? So, so here's my thing. I like this art. I like. I but I also um, I follow Stepan. 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 I follow his blog, his deviant art. Like he posts all these jokes. There's one set. Of, there's one thing I do want to talk about about the world and some of the character renderings, and I'll get to that in a minute. But um, so for the most part, I really like this style, and I get really into it. There's a couple of times though where because he's trying to use like his obvious talent with like faces and stuff to create the sense of conversation. But because it's so photorealistic, I found myself thinking of the video game, Max Payne, <laughs> where the comic panels are rendered in between, but they're actually photos of people. And then there's another series that Marvel pulls out from time to time during their event books. That's usually like, um, I can't remember what it's called. Oh, is this the front line? Front line yeah. yeah. Where it's like rendered hyper realistically mm. and it, or it almost looks like, you know, they took photos and then yeah. made a photo comic out of it, which is a thing. Yeah. And so sometimes occasionally I'd be like, kind of just like looking at it being like, wow, that seems so like almost like I found myself really conflicted with it because I'm like, if this was real people, this would be so bad, but I'm almost positive it's not, which means it's really good. <laughs> and it was like only like one out of every hundred panels. So I'd be like, da, 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 reading, reading, reading. And I had the same pacing issues, right? Like in the great traditions of certain sections of high fantasy, which I'm sure Tobi and I can go into. All right. uh, he, he, he definitely <laughs> dove into like the, you know, like, look, think about the beginning of the Lord of the Rings movies yeah. as Peter Jackson presents them, you know, there was this, and there were these people, and there were these things, and they were, came from the mountains, and they did all this crap, and you're just like, oh, oh okay. Yeah. Buckle so like, up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're like, all righty then. So, like, in that way, it's, I under, I was getting a little overwhelmed, but I kind of saw, saw it through, and I I think you're right that the pacing chart, that the pacing stuff kind of fixes itself, especially when it, I mean, clearly when it focuses more on Lin and Stein. Yeah. Because I think the big problem is that at first it's like there's all these characters mm-hmm. and you're like, who are my narrative threats? Yeah. Like, who am I supposed to actually and I be? I think it does a poor job of introducing the main characters in some ways because when you're introduced to Stein, you're also introduced to his group of friends. Right. Which who, are essentially irrelevant for the rest of the story. Yeah. And so I was like, who are these motherfuckers? And then they don't show up ever again. I'm like, when are those motherfuckers going to show back up? And yeah. they don't. Yeah. They're like a weird Greek chorus. They're just supposed, supposed to be like, you know, and this is Stein and this is what he does. You know, yeah, and that I, kind of thing. I wish they had not put those guys in the yeah, book. they're a little too much like exposition after yeah. this main like info dump. Essentially, yeah, right. one thing I did really appreciate with like how the story flowed uh, was that there was like this massive info dump, and I was reading. I was like, there is no way in hell I'm going to remember any of this shit. Like, I'm going to turn the page and I'm going to forget everything. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of reiteration. And I think that really helped because it was like, oh, okay, that's right. Like, they did mention this in the beginning. And, like, you know, like, they're talking about, like, the Grim Loss. And when they first introduce it, you're like, I don't know what that is. I will never know what that is, apparently, because mm-hmm. you're just going. But they keep reusing the phrase in a way that's like, this is what it is. Okay, we're going to revisit it. This is what that is. And by the time that you hit, like, the second volume, you actually feel much more comfortable in the world. And you feel like you have a sense of, like, okay. 
you know, like we've got people who are dragons. We have people who turn into dragons. We have people that control dragons. We have people that fly on dragon. You know, like, and they're all different. Yeah. And the, we have these type of weapons, and we have th these different factions. It, like, you understand it, and you have like your own ground that you can stand on and sort of explore the world for yourself as the story guides you. Know, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah I, think they did I agree. A, I think they do a pretty good job. There's a couple of times where they get into the, as you know, captain exposition problem mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. where you're like, you know, as you know, captain, the Romulans have intruded into the neutral zone. It's like, well, if you knew the captain knew that, why the hell did you say it? For and the, like, for and the like, audience yeah, well, for the audience, yeah, dirt. Dirt. it's like, I, and I think the, that's the one nice thing about writing high fantasy quote unquote, is that you can kind of like, you can ape like classical notions of speech and then like wrap up your exposition in that like, you know, well, Lord, blah, 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 the thing and the thing and the blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, no one would really normally talk that way. But I guess like ye old fantasy kings talk that way. So it might make sense <laughs> that they're telling him things again. Well, th this, this actually gets into what I wanted to talk about in terms of this work in reference to fantasy as a greater thing. Mm -hmm. Uh are any of you familiar with with, with the term uh, flanderization? No. Nope. <laughs> yeah. It's basically this idea that as a series goes on, certain characters tend to become more and more simplified and exaggerated versions of themselves. And it's named after Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, who mm. in the very beginning of the series, like, he is Homer's opposite number. Like, he's everything that Homer is not. He's a good neighbor. He's a good father. He's polite to everybody that he meets. He likes going to church. Like, mm. he is good in all the ways that Homer is bad. And as the series went on, he became more of the, you know, oakily dokily yippily zippily like, spewing nonsense, like, super churchy, super nice, like, just becoming dumber and more exaggerated. Mm. And, like, this is something that you can see in a lot of different things. Uh, if you've ever watched the show Friends... Uh, all of those characters become more and more exaggerated as the series goes on. At the very beginning, Monica is like, she, you know, she's a little bit like a type personality. Like things have to go this way because that's how I want them. And by the end of the series, like she's 100% like obsessive, compulsive, like clean freak, like flipping her shit. If everything is not exactly the way that she wants it. And she gets to boss all of her friends around. Mm. And I think as a genre, fantasy has gone undergone its own kind of flanderization. And if you look at fantasy in its modern incarnation, starting with Tolkien, like you had this certain idea of like, well, there's elves and wizards mm -hmm. and dwarves and magic, and there's you know these co rough concepts. And as time has gone on, this I, these concepts have gotten more complex, more exaggerated versions of themselves. So when you jump into a high fantasy story today like this one it's like okay here's 30 pages of like all of these words that i just made up that mean all of these different magic items and you've got this guy who's a caster and he uses maga which is what we're calling mana in this series and this guy's a neckrite but he also has a grimloss and when neckrites use grimlosses they can't do this thing and yada and you spend as much time telling the audience what the story like what the setting is and how it works as you do actually telling the story mm -hmm. and i think that this really gets bogged down at the, at the beginning and it recovers somewhat cuz you kind of hit a certain point and it's like okay now that i have these basic concepts i understand what's going on but i don't think it ever recovers from this like dndification of fantasy well, where it's like, well, this person's a dragon rider and dragon riders have these powers. And then it's like every single character that you meet has a new set of magic that works in a slightly different way that has all of these different weird interactions with all the other different kinds of magic. And that's why I guess it feels less like Lord of the Rings to me and more like uh, like an RPG or like it, a JRPG. It feels like somebody is telling me about their D&D campaign yeah. setting as much as they're telling me a story. Right. S okay. Sorry. No, go ahead. My brain's got please. like five things. So first, take one. I'm, it's funny that you start with flanderization because then you're describing actually the opposite of that, 
right? Because like in the Flanderization, it's like things become simplistic. Well, it's, it's a thing like, exaggerated. Yeah, but this I would argue that this is slightly different. There's also a term for that that's that's been bandied around specifically, and that American sitcoms in particular are known for this. Not just Flanderization, but this like weird move to farcical because, and mm-hmm. it actually gets brought up by people. If you like listen to the commentary, even of the guys who did Friends, like they talk about it because you get to the point where like you can't just tell more stories about the way they were because like they're dynamic people and like those stories are dull how do you get laughs out of somebody if you if they already know these people right and like there's this weird escalation i really wish i had it at my fingertips i've got it bookmarked somewhere uh, i believe it might have been justin alexander of the alexandrian.com who's a relatively prolific rpg writer but he actually wrote an essay specifically about this 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 phenomenon, which he actually called, I think, the RPGification of fantasy settings, yeah. which is that rather than creating holistic worlds of magic, it is the case that many writers create what would be broken down into classes, or different a, classes a game of system, right? You know? Different classifications of ability and all these other things. And I think it's kind of like a weird double-edged sword, right? Because how do you create something that feels dynamically different than like there are elves and they do magic? Because like that's been done, like as as this as fantasy as a concept and high fantasy as a subgenre exists, like it's really hard to walk into the room and think about creating something after you've had not only Tolkien but like Weiss and Hickman and all their work in Dragonlance, which was actually aping stuff. Ed Greenwood with Forgotten Realms, not to mention China Mayville and all those guys who basically came in and like broke the genres and created all new stuff, and even R. R. Martin who's basically stealth inserting a high fantasy story into a non-fantasy world until you realize that half the time you're actually reading about people who are bending the laws of physics and or interacting with things that have no right to exist like at this point if you sit down to be someone who's telling a high fantasy story i think it's really hard to wrap your head around how do you make it uniquely yours Mm -hmm. and give it its own flavor and then um also not bog people down with the things that you're trying to make it unique from and i think ultimately mars and say sage 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 find their pacing by realizing that what's the big secret you focus on your characters over the setting right mm-hmm. the setting stuff will seem more vibrant and interesting once your characters seem fully realized and by the time you get to lynn and stein so what i noticed for me in particular was it's like by the time that i remembered what lynn and stein's name were was when woden showed up mm-hmm. yep the dragon guy <laughs> And I thought he was hilarious. I was like, I would love to see this in film because that guy is awesome. He's like, Woden does not care. Woden will. And I was like, I could hear him. I knew exactly what he sounded like. I knew exactly what was going to happen. I was like, wow, this is going to be awesome. And I got really satisfied by it. But it was because all of a sudden I was dealing with tangible people. Yeah. Not caring as much that the Dragon Rider class got plus three to a Thermo yeah. class. But. And, and that's exactly it. Like, throughout the first volume, it's like, here's this guy. He has a bow. He does magic bow stuff. Here's a guy. He's a dragon caster. He turns into a dragon and does dragon things. Here's this girl. She also rides dragons, but she does this different thing. It's like once they stopped introducing new characters, all of which had new class abilities, mm. and started focusing on the characters that they had and actually letting us get to know them, that's when I really got into the story and actually started enjoying myself so that yeah. by the time i got to the end i was like i want to read the next one yeah which starting out i was like i can't wait to be done this I, don't want to keep <laughs> no, I, I was exactly the same way which is why i wanted to talk to you guys about it because it's like i i started reading this for out of the fridge and i was like i i am gonna hate this i'm gonna hate it because like it's not normally my style of art it's hyper digital it's from top cow who on out of the fridge picked this book so we we did a month which has yet to begin in our release schedule but like we did a month where we all picked books we hadn't read before that like we had heard about and so uh allison poppy of out of the fridge who's a big rat queens fan knowing that stepan is going to be the new artist was like, well, I should read his previous stuff because I've never read any of it. And so picked up Ravine and was like, let's read this one. And so none of us had read it before okay. we read the show, um, before we recorded that episode. So I was like, it's top, it's Ron Mars, it's top cowish stuff. Like, I'm not a huge fan of that. And it just, I thought I was going to hate it. But by the end of the second volume, I was like, fuck, what? Oh, when's the next one come out? <laughs> there is one other thing that bothered me, although they did subvert it at the end. Which is all of like the ridiculous like JRPG boob plate armor yeah, that all the say, women like, are running that's around the in. First thing they mentioned, or the, the like fridge. snake woman where she's like, "Oh man, like now I have to be naked all the time." Isn't that shitty, everybody? Oh, my snake scales that are strategically placed over just my boobies, right? <laughs> and like, you know, at the end they did subvert it because they're like, "Yeah, cutting holes in your armor is dumb." 
you're right. gonna get stabbed yeah. okay so and that like on that level i was like okay so this was this is something that came to me very quickly because if you follow stepan and his wife because she's an artist too and she yeah. posts some stuff is they post jokes all the time about like the inappropriate garb of superhero dumb like there's this he has like this fantastic four panel thing which it's like harlequin dressed in her outfit and it's winter time and she's like so cold and it's like poison ivy in the summer and she's like i'm so hot like all this stuff and then there's like one character who like is immune to all of it but is like in normal clothing and she's like i don't really like a sweater or something she's like i don't really get what's wrong with you guys like (laughs) maybe put on some clothes and like so he posts all these things all the time like he's obviously very aware of it but he also has this hyper realistic style and he obviously has references that he like he uses attractive people. So the two mm-hmm. thing that occurred to me during reading this is the very first thing that I saw was Lynn. And of course she flies into the, uh, you know, she's flying on her dragon. She flies into the, the, this fort and she runs into Ariana, right? Mm-hmm. Who's got the leg and all this stuff. Well, Ariana's dressed in a flat breastplate yes. and all this stuff. And so I'm like, okay, so at least only there's, one of them is wearing, there's weird a few women in this that, that wear are dressed regular, yeah, that are wearing flat. regular armor. But then of course the other thing I noticed right away was that Lynn had the holes cut out under her armpits. And I'm like, okay, well something's got to come of that either. Why, or, but that's like the most ridiculous. And I was like, okay, are you going to do that to everybody? It's like, no, no, yeah. the woman has that. So I'm like, what is the advantage of having your underarms airing out and your chain mail when everybody else is like, I'll just wear full chain mail. Thank you. And then the other thing that I was just reading this entire book being like, man, it is awesome to be in this planet, apparently, if you're a guy. Because there's not there's tons of women around, strong, weak, whatever, but they're all good looking. There's tons of ugly guys, but right there at the end, there's like the orc lady shows up, but she's still like really attractive for an orc right. lady. And then there's the one old lady who like is the chambermaid who shows up right. for four panels. Yeah. Otherwise I'm like, okay. But, but she's still like a handsome woman. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? So like, it was just like, <laughs> like a she... handsome older woman. Well, yeah. It's a yeah. thing. No, I know. Excuse you. No, no, it is. <laughs> oh, I'm not correcting you. But yeah, that was like the one thing where I'm like, okay, no no ugly women in this world. Ugly men, no ugly women. That's mm. kind of strange. But yeah, I also couldn't I mean, quite like I kept looking for it. So most people have like the weird ears with like yes. the hole cut in it. And I think some people don't, but I couldn't figure out any rhyme or reason for who had weird ears. Yeah, I can't either. I think they're different races. Okay. Because so, like if you, cause I noticed the ears too. Um, some of them are like folded over double. And then some of them are just kind of pointy, and then some of them bend out a little bit more, and they hmm. all kind of have slightly different features. So I think it's this assumption that like there is an extreme like blending of races, and so these are like genetic traits, or maybe they didn't put that much thought into it and just draw ears willy nilly. But um, yeah, I I noticed that too. Like the ears were all over the place. In yeah, style. I mean, there's a couple of guys who've got there's tons of guys who've got regular ears, then the dragon riders and those guys they've got like the weird notches Mm -hmm. and stuff so yeah variations on man and there's apparently like some people who come from an old world or something that have like super magic or whatever and i'm wondering if like some people are descended from them and that's the difference yeah i i mean i think that some of that's going to be revealed later i would presume so i really like the the super magic because I, as much as I like Lord of the Rings and those kind of like, and uh, Game of Thrones, which I love, there's nothing I love more than like dudes shooting giant fireballs and like ice magic and like mm-hmm. all this like elemental kind of v- very video game magic at each other. Like I love that. And I love it in the end when, um, what's his name? Uh, Stein. Stein. When he goes like Super Saiyan evil mode. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. And, uh, this this uh, is a complete tangent. Have yes. you ever seen a French cartoon called Wakfu? No. I think you'd like it. Okay. I probably would. I if like anybody cartoons. out there is interested, it's based on a French MMO, but they made a cartoon of it that's pretty good. It's 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 like CG animated, but it's like very flat. Hmm. Um, and at one point, there's this like old man who goes Super Saiyan mode, and he's just like flying around shooting fireballs and like smashing into things but he's moving so fast it's doing the thing where like gravity doesn't have time to operate so he's just moving through rocks that are floating in air because he just hit them like he hit the ground so hard that sh- all the shit yeah, flies yeah. up and then he's flying around and stuff has not had time to fall yet so it's just all hovering in mid-air. i love that kind of stuff i thought you would yeah i love well i mean i grew up watching dragon ball z right like that explains a lot about how i think about like guys who move fast and fight quickly uh should look so i don't know i 
I just thought I I love that scene at the end when they fight Woden and just the oh you're right killing the first one is difficult and then killing the next like 200 wasn't as hard and then killing the next four and you're like what the fuck is this guy and you'd had that one teaser moment where the dragon looking guys saw him and he's just got that like cloud of souls coming up oh, there, out were, of the top yeah, there were a bunch of indications way yeah before that yeah but that was the first one where i was like oh, okay that's like he means like a lot of people have died like a lot like yeah. m- way more than i thought <laughs> and uh no by that time you like no i guess i guess it was a little bit after that you got confirmation of who he was yeah but they, they're like there were foreshadowing because it was before that. It's like right after that that he's talking to his brother, right? right? But yeah. Even going back to the like beginning when those two guys are riding back to the town that he was at, mm-hmm. and like they find that one wyvern, yeah. the wyvern corpse, and it's like in the crater, and then there's like the huge blast zone around yeah. it, and they're like, what, what is? What do they call him? The the Navas the uh, Reaper. Of yeah, the Reaper the of whatever that thing. They're like, oh my god, the Reaper is back. And you're like, no, it was this guy. Yeah. And then, like, as things go on, you're like, oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, it's like after that scene that they confirm it. But that was another piece of foreshadowing that he is the Reaper. Right. But like, I that's the moment where yeah. I was like, okay. Yeah. I, I get it now. Yeah. That reminds me, actually, I do have a problem. So I was reading the second volume, mm-hmm. and everybody kept referring to him, to Lynn as like a wanderer or like things about being a wanderer and he never told her that he was a wanderer and like they're still acting like it's this big secret but everything that they're saying is like very clearly like yeah he's like he's a wanderer that's what Mm -hmm. he does he's he's like you yeah but there's no point in her reactions or anything where she's like, Oh my God, like, you know, nothing like, yeah, I don't know what they're going to do with that. that. Cause when does she like actually find out? Well, she, she knows she by hasn't. she, well, she knows she's a wanderer because she, no, no, no. Just, when she finds out that he's a wanderer. I don't think she has. I, yeah. yeah. She hasn't yet, okay. but they keep calling him a wanderer. Like, but mm. she's not reacting to it as like, wait a minute. It may be that she just doesn't realize that they're using that as a proper noun. I mean, the word wanderer in and yeah. of itself has a meaning. I mean, yeah. I don't remember but anyone given, else referring to him as being one. So. I, they do it, like, in the last couple pages, like, a whole bunch. And the thing is, like, yeah, she could not realize that it's, like, being used as a proper noun. But in the world that they live in, I feel like that would be a major, like, tip-off mm-hmm. of something. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Well, I'm looking at the last couple of pages, and I'm not seeing it. It's like... Uh, I mean, I can, I can see that. Oh, yeah, he does say, um, what's your impression of my friend Stein the Wanderer? Yeah, and like, and they say a couple other times, like when she gets the dress from the uh, matronly lady, stuff like that, like she... The, the handsome older lady. She <laughs> says something about him being a wanderer. Yeah, and he's Lord like, Stein the Wanderer. Yeah. They just call him a wanderer. And it's like, hmm, you would think if it's a secret that they would not refer to him as such. Yeah, I'm really not sure. I I didn't pick up on that. As everyone looks at their copies. Yep. Yeah. I was, <laughs> we're all like, wait, where is that? Uh, yeah, that is weird. I didn't notice that. It also took me kind of a long time to realize what they were meaning when they said Wanderer. So maybe she's in the same boat and that it's kind of a vague term on purpose. Yeah. Maybe. I don't I don't really know. Uh, I'm not sure That either. is weird. It's weird that I didn't notice. I, uh, but there's a lot of information in the book. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing. Like they throw around all of these goddamn terms. Like it's hard to keep what's what straight. I was re looking through the beginning of this while we were talking, and something that I really love about Peter Jackson's version of Lord of the Rings in the film is mm-hmm. the is actually like one of my probably my favorite part is the opening scene um, when it's like all who lived have forgotten. And it's Galadriel doing the narrative voiceover of mm-hmm. the battle where Isildur cuts the ring or whatever. Yeah. Um, how there's all, it's mostly narration 
And then at the end, when it's um, Elrond. Elrond, thank you. I was like, what's that guy's name? Elrond and uh, Isildur, they're going to throw the ring in that you finally get um, the characters actually speaking. Where in this, you have narrative and you have voice, uh, like spoken characters dialogue. speaking. Dialogue, thank you. You're and welcome. it's uh, it's been a long day. And <laughs> you have dialogue and they really like, they don't mesh well. And sometimes I like it in a book that uses it to like put you off. Like uh, Black Hole does that, um, where the narration and the dialogue are happening at the same time and they're supposed to distract you from each other sort of. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. To make you kind of feel off put. But in this, I feel like it's, it just feels, it's overwhelming in two different ways because you're switching between like what you're reading and also there's just a ton of information flying at you that if this had, if that opening scene had just been narration boxes, I think it would have worked a lot better. And that information dump wouldn't have felt as jarring. I I think that you could have done it just in narration boxes. I think you could have also probably made it shorter. Yeah. I don't know. That's I think that's the hardest part of this to read. And then also the introduction of the two main characters, they they both seem to take a little bit too long. Yeah. yeah. But then, I don't know, then the pacing finally gets... Because I, I really like the introductions of the new characters when it's like, that guy has a magic bow, and that guy's this thing, and this guy's that thing. Because it matters, you know? Like, you're yeah, going to meet all I, of them again I later. I feel like later, later on the introductions get a little bit more concise and a little bit more, like... Yeah. I guess to the point, concise, whatever. Um, but it's like, okay, here's this person. We're moving on. Like even Woden, like when they introduce Yeah, like him. Woden is a great introduction. He's yeah. like, oh, who's like, this guy who's talking? Uh, I guess he's Woden maybe? Or maybe he's talking to Woden? Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, he just killed a bunch of guys. Okay, that was cool. Oh, yeah. here's some guys telling us about Woden. That makes sense. Oh, look, now Woden's trying to kill our friends. Oh, that was awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, it yeah. works a lot Yeah, it's, it's an introduction as well as action, and, like, it moves the story forward, and you get to experience more of the world. You get to experience more of, like, the main character. You know, like, you learn a lot in these scenes with Woden, mm-hmm. and... Maybe they just had to find their stride. I think I think it is a little bit of that, where it's like you have to find what works for you in the story, and like there's so many things that at the beginning of a novel or a comic book series, like it takes them a little while to find their legs yeah. to get the story going, and so that's why I can kind of forgive like the early pacing issues because yeah. what comes later in the story is stuff that I really like. So I found it. It's kind of weird and it's not very strongly done, but basically the implication is that after the cave, the moment where they're sharing in the cave, mm-hmm. Lynn's monologue goes on. So she's like, good night, Stein, you too, Lynn. Then she says, we carried on towards Way the next morning. By the 14th day of our journey, Stein the Wanderer had become my friend. Travel long enough with someone, I guess, not that I would know, this being my first journey and all, but we talked of legends, adventures, fallen kingdoms, of food, drinks, and other things, of flights, of friendships, blah, 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 blah. And in the end, with that came trust, which the two of them curled up together with the dragon. And then from there on out, he's referred to as Stein the Wanderer by the other people who know him in the town. So I think the implication is meant to be that in some part during that whole talk where he, she's like, you know a lot about wanderers and he tells about the Reaper of Andalat and the King and all that stuff that he either implies enough to her or she gets the sense that he's the wanderer oh, and, or that, her monologue is meant to be backward looking, but then that doesn't explain why people in real time are saying it. But uh, regardless, that's where the break happens is she now, refers now, to him. Now that you mentioned that, I do recall like right before that part, they're talking uh, and he talks about running from fate. Right. In kind of an oblique way. Yeah. So I could definitely be it, see it as something that is a conversation that happens off panel. Yeah. But I was just like, mm-hmm. fine. Yeah, cool. That would make sense. But yeah. I mean, on the other hand, as far as, as long as, as <laughs> despite the complexity that can make it a little hard to read, I'm actually kind of impressed by the sheer volume of crap. Now this can get too, too bad like too much i know that one of the series that i started trying to read that my father got kind of far into was um oh i'm gonna start talking and i don't even remember the name of the series oh 
I'll have to look it up. But um, I, I know that you've read all of A Wheel of Time. Well, uh, no, or not most all of it. Not all of it. Most of it. I a read, large chunk of it. Yeah. You read a like you've read a lot of fantasy novels. Yeah, far more than I. What's have. the one that you and Sam read? That you the. Well, the one I used to be really into was Sword of Truth. Uh, is that the one? But uh, was Percy Jackson? The... No, I never read. Oh, I've no. read parts of Percy Jackson. No, it's not that one. They they made a show of it, and the show's not very good. Yeah, Legend of the Seeker. That one. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's the sort of truth. Okay. Sort of All right, I don't know what they're called. The show was actually kind of okay if you like Xena slash Hercules. Sam didn't like it. So. That's what I've heard. Is that I, the, the I series was okay? The, show. the books. I I boggles my mind on some days how you read all of those. Well, I was young and impressionable. And apparently also, I like me some Ayn Randisms. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, gosh, I wish I could remember the name of this series. Um, I don't even know where to begin. It kind of came out of nowhere, but there's already like 12 books. And the guy who wrote it basically said that originally he had come up with it as a and d setting, basically. Or like he was writing it with his friend and then they started writing Oh, it's going to bother me all day. <laughs> <laughs> Just ignore me. <laughs> okay. Um, we will do that. You look that up. Um, I did want to ask you guys a little bit about, like, how did you feel about the world that they created? Not so much as, like, how they introduced it, but just, like, the world as a whole. Like, did it w- work for you guys? Because I find a lot of stuff really interesting about it, like the I God under the mountain type that stuff. That is the one part that I absolutely, like, unambiguously loved, was yeah. just these, like, eyes pre- peeking out from a hole under this mountain. And they're like, yeah, this seems like a good idea to worship this thing as a god. Yeah. That's totally going to mm-hmm. work out. That's not creepy at That's all. That's very, like, Conan and, like, Hyborian. To yeah, like, absolutely. I totally loved that. That was another moment that was just like hooked yeah, me. Yeah, that was one hundred percent great. And that the, was actually probably the first moment that I started liking this series. And the panels, the panel layout in that part, because they show the whole like door where the eye is coming through is like in front of all the panels that are happening behind. Right. And yeah. it's like some of the panel layout I really like in this book because he'll take a character from in the panel and just put them in front of the panels. So like while the panels are happening in the background, like there's like a guy who puts a helmet on in one scene, but his character model or like he is in front of the panels, like with his helmet on. Cause he's, that's him from the bottom panel, but it overlaps the top two panels where he doesn't have his helmet on. This is like really yeah. cool, interesting mm-hmm. panel layout design in the book. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of really interesting dynamic things that are going on with the way that the book is constructed. I like some of the gutters. Like in some of the gutters, there's cool designs going on. I didn't notice that. There's, I, yeah, no, yeah. I did notice that. It had a very like uh, illuminated manuscript mm-hmm. type of feel to it. That was really cool. Yeah. It's not for all. Like most of the gutters are just black, but... There are some specific spots in the book where the gutter work is, like, really cool. I'll try to find one. Also, I love it when it's, like, the pages that clearly look like they're from a history book or something, and there's just, like, actual right. text just on the panel Yeah, see, that reminded page. me specifically of a D&D campaign setting. Book. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, that's what that looks like, yeah. and that actually bothered me. Oh, well, I like that kind of – I love that kind of <laughs> art and that kind of stuff, so – Okay, I see what you're talking about. The scroll work is around the outside of the panel, like all throughout the prologue. Yeah. The, this is the the other scene I was talking about was the page where they show the like eye right. thing and it's yeah. like overlapping this two page spread. Um and my copy doesn't have page numbers, but digitally it's page sixty of the first volume. So I do wish that I had known there was an appendix in the back, though. That's the one thing about reading books digitally that I don't like, is it's, like, really difficult to go back and forth between where you were and where the appendices are. Yeah. Where in a print novel, you could just, like... No, I, w- I was reading this at work, because, you know, I'm very good at my job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, like, hiding in the back, like, going, like, flipping through uh, with the space bar, because I was reading it digitally. Um, and, like, I got to the appendix, and I was like, God Damn it! This would mm-hmm. have been so helpful. Like it's exactly what I did. Yeah, <laughs> so like so take a screenshot point, on your iPad and <laughs> leave it open. In there the was one thing that I really liked on the page after, just after the one that you referenced, Chard, mm-hmm. um, when the the evil Pope guy shows up riding the red dragon and he yeah. lands, and you can see that there's like these big stone drums surrounding a central structure. Yeah. And it's like, those are dragon landing pads. Yeah. Like they're specifically constructed that and reminded me of some, like they reference basically exactly that thing in, um, 
His Majesty's Dragon, which is a series of uh, – Oh, you've talked about uh, this. Where Napoleonic, like, like yeah. dragon riding war Naomi books. Novik. You talked about yeah, that when they, we were talking about Yeah, Forex. it's really great. Yeah. And they talk about like all the different things that have been constructed specifically for dragons. Like these ships are built specifically so that dragons can land on them without tipping the ship over and stuff. Mm. And I just noticed this little background detail. Like this building has been built so that dragons can land here. And I thought that that was just a cool random little detail. Yeah. Yeah, I I think a lot of thought went into this, and that's it's pretty obvious that they spent a lot of time coming up with the setting, and I really like it. Perhaps too much time. Well, I mean, <laughs> to each his own, and I I guess like kind of to go off of what Brant was talking about with the whole notion of fantasies becoming the RPGification of fantasy, and like how do you separate yourself when there's so much being written in that. Style. It makes right. me think of stuff like Orkstein, which is just like so not of the fantasy genre, but in a fantasy setting that it like can very easily distance itself from that. Rat Cleans is kind of the same way where it's like we've seen all this stuff before, but the story is not about the stuff in the background. It's about these people in the foreground. But when you're trying to create like a new, rich, dense world, like I think sometimes people make a lot of the same mistakes that video game designers will make when they're thinking about this kind of stuff. And they're like, well, how do we make it different but similar at the same time? And right. so it's like, well, these guns are more different than those uh, other guns. If you go on TV tropes, which you should never do because you'll <laughs> just waste your entire day, uh, that's I called that these website. vampires are different or our vampires are different. Where yeah. they, like the setting will go to great lengths to explain this like new thing that they come up to. And it's like, well, that that's vampires. You just describe right. vampires, and they're like, "No, our vampires are different. Like they don't drain blood; they drain like life force through mm-hmm. holes in their hands." Like, yeah, our vampires are sparkly. Yeah, yeah. it's like <laughs> it's just a vampire. Like you don't have to make up a new thing when you can just use. It's like yeah. you don't have to come up with a brand new elder race that's in touch with nature and magic and is long lived and kind of aloof. Like. Those are elves. Yeah, but you just kind call of, them elves. You kind of do though. And but that's, why? Well, here's here's why. And I think that it's so. I think when I play stuff like The Legend of Zelda, mm-hmm. and I see what they create in those worlds, like specifically in Wind Waker, which is one of my favorites, because it has this real sense of time. Like there mm-hmm. was stuff that came way way before where we're at now, and then there's this, and like this is all a reaction to what happened way 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 long ago. You have this race of, like, nature-loving creatures, and they're, like, little, tiny, adorable, cute tree men. Yeah. And, like, that's... I would much prefer to see those as opposed to elves. And when you flash back to, like, um, Ocarina of Time, which is referenced in Wind Waker, and you have the the Kakarioko Village kids... It's you mean like the Kokiri? The Kokiri Village, that's what it is. Yeah. Like, they're very much like the elves of that world, but they instead, they're so in touch with nature and they're so about like, you know, living in harmony and they're, they're attuned and they're magic and they're, you know, they live forever. They're immortal, but just simply by changing the fact that you don't make them aloof and that you make them young children, like changes a lot about the way I feel about, well, but that's characters. different though. Well, that's what I mean is like, if every book used the same, like these are elves and these are dwarves and these are this and these are that, and th- like the, the genre would bore right. the ever living. But the thing is that if you're going to make it different, you need to make it different, not just right. like co- make a few cosmetic changes and then call it something. Else. Okay. No, I agree Humans with you with on that hats. one. What's that? Humans with funny hats. Exactly. Like, I agree with you on that one. But I do, I I really dislike the whole, like, it's fantasy, so there are dwarves. Like, I hate that kind of thing. Oh, I absolutely hate it, too. Okay. I'm just saying, like, if you're going to have dwarves in your setting, just call them dwarves rather than calling them something slightly different and making them exactly the same thing. Right. No, I understand. Do something different or just use dwarves. Don't make up something that is dwarves with a different name on it and a coat of paint. Yeah. So I had to I had to use my call a friend and <laughs> have my dad remind me who who this was. Stephen Erickson's The Malazan Back Book of the Fallen series. That sounds which, vaguely familiar. Which started in nineteen ninety nine, comprises ten books. And my God Com- like it's not like complicated in the sense that like oh, I can't follow it I'm like I'm my brain doesn't handle it so no snarky comments listeners it was just uh, it was just <laughs> well, like whoa well, our listeners are very polite <laughs> no, and I kind know, yeah. and they've never said anything horrible I know, about I know. us I can just imagine somebody being out there like well oh, I could read it fine I don't know YouTube. what your problem is yeah no, <laughs> but anyway it was just like it was that it was what we were talking about with this where it's like. St- 
17 different nations locked in a hundred years of various political trickeries with ancient gods who are wandering around and like there are different people and they have different skills and oh my god there's that guy with that skill walking around the corner we're all afraid of that guy with that skill what is that guy with that skill well this guy with this skill doesn't really care about him so that means he's really important you know it's just like it was just so much to take in that i just could not handle it and it and it's the one that always comes to mind whenever we talk about like this notion of like it seems like everybody's got their own class and it's so mm. complicated. And it's like, it's hard because I think Toby's made this comment recently along uh, about other series, which is the, the trick is if you're a good writer, it's about making it effortless, seeming effortless, mm-hmm. you know? And I guess that is why Martin is so popular right now, because actually there's a crap ton of information in those books, but yes. he either, he somehow he manages to convince you that you either don't care or that you're going to retain it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like it does, you know, it is. Well, it's weird because so much of the information that he presents to you, you don't even notice when he presents it because so much of it is in oblique references or in things that you are inferring the thing from the things he's saying. Like he, at one point he's like, you know, oh, you know, blah, 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 the red priests from Ashai. And you're like, I don't know what red priests are and I don't know what Ashai is. And then three books later, there's this character who shows up who's a red priest. And suddenly that stuff is important. And you're like, right. well, I don't even remember when they referenced to this offhand. Right. Uh, even, it, the first reference to the Unsullied is in like the second chapter of the first book. Right. And you don't meet Unsullied until like way the hell later. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of the stuff that Nan talks about to Bran, like yeah. the stories of the old world and all that crap. And you're just kind of like, oh, those are some interesting fairy tales. Holy crap. Those things are there. It's all <laughs> real. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like Martin is very, very good at seeding random pieces of information. Well, it makes the world feel full, right? But it doesn't make you feel like you need to know it. And that's the thing is that it's background references to non-specific things. It's not like, oh, that guy's a neckrite; he has a grim loss. Like, yeah, where you're like, I'm completely lost by that sentence. It's yes. like, oh yeah, this blah 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 thing from this faraway land that we don't really care about. That's oh, someone is only referencing tangentially. Right. Like, it doesn't matter to your understanding of what's happening right now, yes. so you don't care. Right. I think the other thing that, that helps with those series, and and I think that's why the pacing in Ravine gets better, is that once you have a sense of personality for people, you can kind of come along with them as far as what is important or not. Because I know that what happens in the Game of Thrones is that there's tons of people in the background talking about stuff, but they're like, and we don't care. And you're like, okay, then I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> like, it clearly you cared enough to write it down, but I believe your character enough. And so, like, when Woden shows up and they have that big fight, you know, or, and after um, Lynn gets hurt and, uh, you know, he's like, I'm going to kill you, you know, ha, ha, ha. You're like, clearly you're not going to be able to stand up to me. And Stein's like, yeah, okay. So now that we're here by ourselves, let's have a conversation about how much you have made a horrible mistake with what you're doing. (laughs) But I'm Woden and I'm awesome. It's like, yeah, not so much. And I'm going to lose my shit now. Uh, my my one counterpoint to that though is that that's like at almost the exact same time when his spirit guide or whatever is like dude the lady that you just sent off is from this race and they can't cast healing spells because they don't have that non-weapon proficiency right it's like what <laughs> like who came up with that rule well so they ma- there's a definition in the glossary that's really helpful that i'm like they don't think they did a good job of articulating that so neck rights are the only cast are the only types of magic users who don't have to pay for their spells either in mana or in life. Right. But that I didn't know that for sure yeah. until I read the thing. So all these other things where the where um er, what's the damn his bonded thing the the lieutenant. Oh, from, uh, uh, oh, I have it. I have oh, it. Oh, right it's now. Azrael. Azrael. Oh. So all the times that Azrael's like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it doesn't have that non perfect. You know, it's like, oh, well, that actually, that would be irrelevant if I had a greater understanding of the magic system well, in a more intuitive way. It's that he doesn't pay mana, but he can't direct his spells. Right. Like, he just casts it and it goes off and he right. has no control over it. Right. And it's like, that is a very useful informa- piece of information that you should not have just stuck in the glossary. Right. Mm. Yeah. It explains why you walk around alone. <laughs> right yeah like that explains so much about who he is and what he does and it's not in the text of the book you have to look in the glossary yeah Ugh, frustrate it's like it's frustrating because it's on so many levels it's really really good and on so many levels it's very very frustrating yeah, yeah. and i i hope to see more growth in this because i know they're working on more 
I'm excited for the more that's coming because I like where the second volume left off. And I like, I like Ron Mars. I like, uh, Stepan and like, I want to see this get more notoriety. Cause I feel like this flew under so many people's radars. that I think would really enjoy stuff like this. You put out this campaign setting book and I would play it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting <laughs> or about a video this. game like this. I would, uh, this is like a more interesting Skyrim to me. Yeah. Is that, you know, we've talked a little bit before about the difference between like when things are intentionally made to be on a month by month versus mm-hmm. like, I've made a comment before that I think there are some things that suffer from that. And I think that that is probably what's hard for this work is that I think if this would have been written as one larger contiguous piece, even in the size of the tra- graphic and you have an editor looking at it, you probably have an editor that's saying, okay, I see where you're going here's how you might need to rearrange some things. But when you're in, you know, and, and to the extent, cause this is through image. Is that right? Yeah. It's top mm-hmm. cow. No, it's, it's, well, it's top act- cow is part of image, but this is actually image image. No, it's top cow. The trades say image on well, the, them and not the top cow. The version I have, the trade says if top you go cow to the last the page. Yeah. If you go to the last page, it says image top cow on it. Okay. Well, oh. they are owned by the same company. So, so, but I wonder like in that setting, where it's mostly about the creator owned stuff. So I assume the editorial is not nearly as aggressive about tone, right? Like they're not going to tell anybody like how to fix their story. They're probably going to do more things like, Hey, I didn't understand this. Are you sure this is the word you meant to use that kind of stuff? Like I can only assume, but I wonder if this would have been, if this series would have smoothed itself out a little bit better, had it had a stronger editorial hand, seeing yeah. seeing a bigger chunk of it rather than having to you know, digest it month by month. Yeah, that could very well be. Or whatever. Was this released month by month? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cuz I could only find it like I downloaded it. I could only find it available in trades. So, I thought it only came out in trades. Someone corrected me and said that it is it did come out in issues, which I never saw. So Okay. They, I never saw. They that. May, they may have the corrected me incorrectly. The trades are arranged but. in a way that it doesn't seem like it had come out month to month. No, it feels well. like they came yeah, out like as I, graphic novels. Like, I didn't yeah. notice any issue breaks. Yeah. 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 No, and in that fact, was in... you had prologue, chapter one, appendix. And at the end of the first volume, it says issue two coming Yeah, and I, I really felt like this was only graphic novels, so maybe someone corrected me incorrectly, but... Well, we'll correct the correction. I'm wondering if this was published something. in association with Top Cow, because Ron Mars is, like, uh, exclusive... To Top Cow? It could be. Because this was an original concept, original idea. It feels very much more like an image book. And if it is published like an image book, then Brant's probably right, where it's like they brought a lot of it already done yeah. to image. Okay, so no, it was released to trade by trade, looks like. Okay. You mean issue That's, by issue or trade by trade? Trade by trade. That's okay. what I thought. Okay. Yeah. There All you right. go. So an ongoing graphic novel series. Which I always ask for. So There should be more of those. Absolutely. Right, well, did we have anything else to say about it, or have we chewed all the fat off of these bones that we can? We can? I, I like that it. I like that it reminds me of Fire Emblem. That's all I'm gonna say. I've never played Fire Emblem. You'd love it. Maybe. I don't know. Did you like Final Fantasy Tactics? I don't know if I ever played Final. Do Fantasy you like Tactics, Tactics games? The only or tactical you, like, game that I really liked is Advanced Wars. Okay, it's it's kind of like that. Do okay. what do you think about that one? I no, I liked Advanced okay, Wars. Okay, cool. You'd like you'd like Fire Emblem. Don't play the uh game boy advance ones they're like super hard okay they'd be frustrating because unlike a regular rpg like when your character dies in combat you're like oh that sure sucks and then the battle ends and then you can like revive yeah, they're them. dead for good i in, know that in much. fire Island, they're dead dead like you don't get those guys back like you're actually like a commander of an army and so if you lose a guy it's like well that guy's yeah, apparently, dead like fire emblem was not released in the u.s for a really long time because yeah. the japanese were like the americans are not gonna like this yeah and a it lot is of, too hard for them yeah and a lot of people don't like it because it is really hard but in the new version the new 3ds one they they have like like classic fire emblem mode where it's like it is that hard still but then they have like american dumbed down version <laughs> where you like guys don't die and you like get restarts and stuff so um, but yeah, you like move your guys around on a big grid and you fight them against each other. But like the mythos feels very much like this where they're like Pegasus riders and dragon riders and dragon guys and mages of different classes and swordsmen and berserkers and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. Totes. Yeah. I find stories like this interesting cause you know, like the Japanese, especially for the video games, but even their anime, like they've stolen for lack of a better word. I'm not like speaking pejoratively. Uh, 
like so many concepts like myth and legends and all this stuff you know it's like you'll watch a japanese anime and it'll be like the ancient god is celt of whatever and you're like okay you guys really looked in an encyclopedia or something to find that so i always find it interesting because i know mars is american but mm-hmm. since um sage is uh Croatian, like how much of this is informed by stuff that he grew up with? How much of it yeah. is because he loves American stuff or like watch a lot of Japanese? Like, it's, I always wonder when people come up with these settings that have these tones to them. Cause you're right. Like, there are moments where people go, you know, like Super Saiyan yeah. and like blow buildings in half or weird shit like that. And you're like, huh. I mean, that happens in D&D sort of, but it's never really carried over into the narrative D&D stuff but it's not, all the way. Yeah. And Although like, it does it's somewhat in the Forgotten Realms, I guess. But Final Fantasy is very much like East meets West, the video game, because there's like a lot of Eastern ideas in Final Fantasy, yeah. but there's also like tons of like Western, like... Uh, like gun blades. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Final Fantasy is kind of just a mash of everything. Yeah, right. there's a lot of like Western influence into it as far as like the medieval aspect of fi- some Final Fantasy stuff, you know? Like yeah. Like creeps mm-hmm. over. No, I know what you're saying. Yeah, because like their dress, the way they dress and stuff is very like, especially in tactics. Um, yeah, it's a it's weird like an Euro exaggerated fusion. Euro style yeah, of like French. It's, it's weird the stuff that the Japanese have picked up on from a Western culture. Like, it's not necessarily the stuff that you'd expect. Like, yeah. they're really big into like paranormal sciences, like ESP, and yeah. like stuff that you think of as being very kind of like seventies, I guess, or like a seventies conception of like psychic abilities you know the paranormal senses it was definitely big here in the 70s right and like i feel like culturally our conception of like psychic powers has mutated and changed over time mutants yeah Yeah, and whereas the japanese like took those same concepts and went in a different direction with it's funny because if you look at like old manga old japanese tv and old anime and stuff you find a lot of similarities between what's going on in the western in western stuff because that like uh cross-pollination of ideas happens a lot Mm -hmm. but like you know if we if i say superheroes to you like obviously you have this very like superman batman like very strong western tradition of superheroes but japan japan has almost as strong as if not like stronger tradition of superhero television and shows and if you say superheroes to them like a lot of time not so much now that the marvel movies and dc movies have like cross-pollinated but they're i mean they're gonna definitely think of like their own japanese superheroes like uh super sentai and kamen rider and ultraman and, and all spider-man that. and spider-man <laughs> um and bat manga and all that stuff so there's definitely like a cross-pollination but i think that we we it's impossible for us to look at it not from a western view when it's like we see stuff in japanese manga and we're like wow that's so western but they'll see stuff and they'll be like no this is very japanese what are you talking about yeah because it's been a part of their culture for so long that it feels inherently native to them as well i don't know well we've absorbed a lot of stuff too that i don't think we especially people who are younger would necessarily be like oh i think that's kind of eastern influence and right it's like oh no like there's like these big articles like how hinduism became a big thing like star wars is riddled with hinduism and like yeah all kinds of other stuff and so it's like there's tons of eastern influences that i don't yeah. think we pick up on exactly because it's we, been part of our exactly, yeah that's exa- well, exactly the same thing i'm saying when, yeah. whenever a culture picks up something foreign like they take the elements that speak to them and dump the rest and mm-hmm. don't really care whereas we might see like you just took something that is inseparable and ripped it apart like yeah. what are you doing And I think that now it's easy to see, like, how interconnected the world is and stuff because the internet and, you know, how fast communication is and stuff. But it's not like 50 years ago, 60 years ago, they were really that isolated either. Like, maybe it just took longer for stuff to go move between cultures. But, like, the free flow of ideas, you know, between East and West cultures has been around for a long time. Kipling was the one that was like, East and West will never meet. And that was, like, his whole weird argument about the jungle book Hmm. um that's like his subtext in there that like eastern and western worlds will never like fully mesh but i think you look at the modern world and you're like eh. no i definitely got that from the necessities well yeah (laughs) (laughs) he he didn't write the musical (laughs) um but like i think time disproves his point where it's like there's so much inseparable about the world because our technology is brought us together but also because people actually are interested in other cultures and want to learn and aren't as dickish as you think they are. So. Some of them are. You sure? But 
I don't know. I'm uh, I'm good on this book. Recommendations? Anything else you guys want to say, Cade? I think I hit all my points. Do you think people who like World of Warcraft and play like fantasy games and stuff would dig on this? Absolutely. Yeah, that's kind of why I got into it too. Kaylee, anything? Nope, I'm good. Really? That's yeah. all you wrote down in your Lisa Frank notebook? Was... Yeah, I, it was a pretty short note taken day because I was supposed to be working. Oh, so, right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hit on stuff that you guys were talking about mm-hmm. because, I mean, a lot of it was a lot of the stuff that Tobiah covered was stuff that I had thought of. And... Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Well, you guys ready to move on to recommendations? Let's do it. Brant, may I start with you? Yeah. Um, I had mentioned it last week, and now I decided I was actually going to pitch it, which is Dylan and Way's Bullseye's Greatest Hits. Ooh. It's kind of weird. It's not really an origin story, but it was kind of written at a time. It was, like, right not too long after the Daredevil movie, so, like, Daredevil actually had, like, the bullseye, like, car. Bullseye? Was, yeah. Is that what I said? You said Daredevil. Oh, <laughs> Daredevil had it. No, Bullseye. Yeah, Bullseye. So had Bullseye had the Bullseye carved into his head, and so he wasn't like walking around in his black and white costume as much. But basically, it's like they've caught Bullseye, and something bad is going to happen if they don't get information out of him. And so an uh, FBI agent, I think, which was also kind of strange at the time to me, it's like, why isn't a Shield agent? Yeah, like is interrogating him, and basically Bullseye is like, "Do you want to hear about like how I got started in this business and how I became a horrible person?" And the guy's like, "I guess." And so, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> basically, Bullseye's talking about his greatest hits, like. Mm. Yeah, you know, this is the time I met it's, the Punisher. It was reprinted in Mar- as Marvel Legends. Yes, it was well, Marvel Knights. I think it was originally published under the Marvel Knights imprint, which oh. is why it would be an FBI agent and not Shield, probably, because Marvel Knights was like supposed to. Well, it's supposed to be more, more adult oriented. I don't think. It oh, was... I'm thinking it's not Marvel Max. No, you mean Marvel Knights? I yeah. see. Yeah. Um, the so the edition I purchased says like Marvel Legends presents Daredevil. And then when you looked at the cover, it said yeah, Bullseye they, Greatest Hits. They collected a bunch of stuff like that. In fact, the book that I'm going to pitch is a Marvel Legends book. That's weird. Even though yeah. it wasn't originally published in that yeah. way. Like, that's mm-hmm. how it was collected. Hmm. Maybe that's just an imprint they're giving to the... Like, lesser known stuff. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. Right, to the trade paperbacks that, like, are good, but, yeah. like, aren't attached to a run. Yeah. yeah. I, I believe that that is the case. I don't know if they're even doing new Marvel Legends anymore, but for a while it was, yeah. like... Here are individual stories like you can, like you want to read about this character like here are the Marvel Legends books like these are good stories to read that you don't necessarily have to read them as part of a specific run. Yeah, mm. but I, I you don't know it is the art reminded me a lot of Dylan's work on Preacher and the Wicked and the Divine reminded me of it at the time and it's just kind of a fun weird little like tonally it's sort of offbeat from the rest of the Marvel universe in a way that a lot of the Marvel Knight stuff was. Mm-hmm. And so it's like weirdly violent, but also fantastic, like fantastical and like the superhero sort of way. And I don't know it, it, for me, it was a story that kind of made um, bullseye a little bit more uh, three dimensional as a character. Like, like why would a guy just like walk around and be an assassin and all this stuff? Like, and I think that Marvel's done pretty good with this over the last 20 years or so is they managed to find writers who kind of are like, here's how this character actually would fit into this universe in a way that makes sense. My other big one being the Batrock the Leaper mini one shot. Oh, where, we, yeah, we've talked about this. Yeah, before. where it's like, oh my god, that explains why such a horrible character would actually be in the Marvel universe. Um, and I'll pitch that one day too. But uh, yeah, so Bullseye's greatest hits. That's my pitch. Sweet, Cade. All right, so I brought uh, an interesting run this week. It's uh, twenty-two issues long. Uh, it's four trades, and that also includes two issues of a different series. Um, this is an anthology series that Marvel put out called Spider-Man's Tangled Web. Oh, yeah. And this is uh, various writers and artists will come on for two to three issues and tell stories of ordinary people living in Spider-Man's shadow. Or Spider-Man's world, um, and it's it's got some very interesting things in it, uh, especially like we were talking earlier about photorealism. Um, a couple of the issues in here is like all 3D animated CGI stuff, um, and then 
it, the, the very next story could be like Archie style drawing and uh, and I think it's really cool. It's very interesting. Uh, just to, to name a few of the people who worked on the series, um, I mean, right away, first issue is Garth Ennis and John McRae. And then you've got Greg Rucca, Eduardo Riccio, Peter Mulligan, um, Ron Zimmerman, Sean Phillips, Brian Azzarello, Paul Pope, Daniel <laughs> Way, and Darwin Cook. Wow. So, like... Each of them do one, two, three issues, tell a story about somebody, and uh, so kind of a fun little book. I mean, some of them are pretty serious, but just different glimpses into a world of Spider-Man. Cool. Did you say when this came out? Oh, uh, it was like 2001, 2002. So, like, during the Straczynski run, or... Kind of. Around-ish? But I don't think it was ever, like, really canon. No, I think the whole thing was that it was supposed to be, like, non-canon. Yeah. Oh, cool. So people had more flexibility to kind of... Cool. This is another book that's uh, edited by Axel Alonzo, who's now editor-in-chief. Oh, cool. I'm now on a huge Spider-Man kick, thanks to the Spider-Verse, so... See, I feel actually a little bit burned out on Spider-Man. Like, I'm reading nah, so much Spider-Verse, I'm like, man, I don't need more Spider-Man. No, I'm like, I'm in it again. I'm all about it. I'm That's about cool. to go back to the beginning and pick up Brand New Day and start over. Oh, God. Because, <laughs> I mean, I like... I have not done that yet. One more I day... I will. One more day made me stop reading Spider-Man, and so there's, like, a good, like, four-year chunk that yes, I missed. same. Yeah, so... And I hear, by all accounts, it's great. And now I like Dan Slott's writing a lot. I'm like, I should go back and check out the early stuff. There's some fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm in exactly the same place. I skipped it. I hear it's great. Mm -hmm. I can't bring myself to go back and read it because it just seems like so much. No, I'm about to go back. I I don't know. I've always had a huge, like, soft spot in my heart for Spider-Man because the animated series was on when I was a kid. He's my favorite superhero. Yeah. He saved you during a soccer game. That's right. Well, well was it a soccer game? Or did you it wasn't exactly a soccer it? game. It was more of a dog pile of small children <laughs> kicking a rubber ball game. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Um, <laughs> listen to episode. I don't remember when you told that story. <laughs> I feel like we talked about it on the favorite superhero bonus episode. Oh, I bet we did. Which is bonus episode, I think, number one. If cool. you want to go check out the episodes page on our website, which I just finally updated after like three months. Hooray! Yay! <laughs> um, yeah, the, the Spider-Man and the X-Men animated series were both on when I was a kid, the Fox ones. Yep. And I always liked the Spider-Man one more than the X-Men one. It was a superior product. Was it? I just, <laughs> okay. I don't know if it was just me remembering yes, it was. It that. That's debatable. No, it's not. <laughs> Based purely on the amount of reused footage. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. The voice actors for the X-Men were pretty awesome. Gene! Gene! <laughs> Morph! The, I made That's the same voice actor. That's just one. Tell yeah. Cyclops I made of a convertible. I, I love Gambit. Gambit's voice in that show is, like, amazing. <laughs> there's the There's, like, a uh, like a photo set that's going around the internet right now where it's, like, Gambit's getting mad at them for, like, ruining the dinner that he made. <laughs> Uh, you can see it if you check out the view from the gutters Tumblr. Yes, because you can. I have full reign of that, and yes. I am just posting shit until somebody stops me. <laughs> <laughs> I, so far, we've not stopped. I there. never go to Tumblr, so I'm not going to stop. Yeah, this. so I'm safe. It's yeah. pretty great. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, cool. So, Kaylee, what did you bring? I I brought something uh, completely new. No, I'm bringing back Captain Marvel. Ah, yeah. damn. <laughs> Fuck you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what's winning. Tonight. This is just turning into a Marvel week. Yep. Uh, so yeah, Captain Marvel. I feel like I've pitched it a lot, so maybe I don't really have to go through everything again. But Carol Danvers. Carol Dan- Danvers it's Carol fantastic. Corp. Gonna do the first trade of uh, In Pursuit of Flight. Do you want to go for two? Okay, we'll go for two. So In Pursuit. I mean, of I'm Flight. I'm completely unbiased in this in any way. Oh, okay. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> Uh, in Pursuit of Flight, and the second one is um, Down? What is the name of it? I can imagine the cover. Captain, Volume 2. Captain Volume Marvel 2, two. Electric <laughs> Boogaloo. <laughs> so, question. Was this the uh, Carol Danvers run that went for 17 issues, or is this the relaunch number one after that no, 17? It's the it's the 17. 
It's okay. when she first becomes Captain Marvel. Okay. And not yeah. Miss Marvel anymore. Yes. That's how the I got starts. really confused when I tried to like download some stuff and I was like, do I want this Captain Marvel number one or the Captain Marvel number one from the next year? Marvel, you See, try so hard. You need to trust yourself. And got so far. Mm-hmm. It's called Down. It is called Down. Yeah. Yeah, got it. I knew Nailed it was it. four letters. I can see the trade cover in my head. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Captain Marvel. Yep. Nothing else to say? Nope. Good job. Uh, I also brought a Marvel book this week. Uh, as I said, it's a Marvel Legends. It's uh, Wolverine Legends number five, which I pitched a long ass time ago. Uh, this was originally released as Wolverine Snicked. Uh, I it- pronounce it Sniked. Well, you'd be wrong. <laughs> I also snicked. pronounce it snicked. Jason Mayhew said snicked in Mallrats, and that yep. is the pronunciation that I've always gone with. That's also what it looks like. But whoever it? drew the uh, the cover said sniked, just like the guy who created gifs. Uh, we don't talk about that. <laughs> you mean God. Gifs? 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 Uh, gifs? They're gifs. gifs. <laughs> they're gifs. gifs. Sorry, I'll stop. Go gifs. ahead. Um, <laughs> so this is a like five-issue miniseries by Sutomu Nihai, who is a manga artist. Oh, yeah. And it's basically, what if Wolverine was in a manga? So basically, he's walking around in New York. This Japanese girl shows up, goes, come with me, and teleports him into a grim future that's all manga-fied. And there's this race of like genetically modified viruses called the Mandate that is wiping out mankind, and only Wolverine can stop them with punching things. Does blood come out of his nose? No. Does he get big teardrops underneath Maybe. his... Does he get a sweat drop or like yeah. a, a stress hashtag no, 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 in no, his no. forehead? It's, yeah. it's the grimdark kind of manga with explosions uh, you know, and ruined futures. The thing that I love about manga is that you can have both in the same book. That's right. <laughs> it's a horrible future. There's a pretty girl. My nose is spraying. Yeah. You gotta have both, man. But uh, it's... I really like the art. It's a cool Wolverine story where he's just like, okay, today I'm... In the future, fighting crap. That's so, that's pretty snick, standard snick. day. Every single time you've pitched this book, you haven't had it with you to hold up the art. And every single time before this, I thought it was a black and white book. No, because no, because no. you say manga, and I th- immediately think like, oh, it's black and white manga. Well, there are like there are big sections of it that are mostly black and white, but it's but then there's also color. digitally painted. Yeah, like, it is digital color of like high def digital color. Yeah, it's by, it's colored by uh, Guru EFX, which I've yeah. never been able to figure out if that's a person or no, like a group. It's a studio. Okay. Just like uh, the guys that colored um, Udon. Yeah, that's an art studio, but there's right. a there's a color effects studio that colored most of Ultimate Spider-Man at the beginning. Right. So like, and it always says like colored by Color Effects or something. Yeah. So, so it's just kind of like a fun one-off Wolverine story where he's in a grim and gritty future fighting. Cool. Genetically modified flesh-eating bacteria robots. Sweet. From Monsanto? No. Uh, this is very important. I, and I cannot remember the name of it, but there is a Wolverine song on YouTube. It's a sing-along, and Duplicate is in it. And it's fantastic. And I, I don't know if any of you would know the name of that song, because it's very no important idea. that our listeners find it. Uh, I don't, but I'm sure if you search... Wolverine sing-along on I, YouTube. You... I, you know, there's a surprising amount of them, and oh. I can't. <laughs> I'm frantic That is surprising to me. So yeah, it's a beautiful book. It's a lot of fun. I had to buy it twice because the post office lost a copy when I moved, and an entire box of my stuff just vanished into the ether. So I like it a lot. Check it out. Sweet. Jard, what did you bring? So good he bought what it What Marvel twice. book did you bring? So I didn't bring a Marvel book because I didn't know it was fucking bring your favorite Marvel book this week. Um, <laughs> also, it's 52 weeks of image, so can't stop, won't stop. Here's some more what, image books. What week of image is it? You know what? Week? It's it's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what week it is is not important. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to feel bogged down by numbers. I'm a free spirit. I need to just like just go. Just do with what the Marvel world. does. Just reboot to number one randomly. You know what? I'm just gonna do forever from now on. Like I'm just not gonna recommend Marvel and DC books anymore. No, I can't do that. That's a, that's a lie. Um, so I'm reading a book I've never read before, which is something that I don't normally like to do because I would feel bad if it's awful. But I have a lot of faith that this is going to be fantastic. So. This is a uh, story and art by J.M. Ken Namura, who did the art for I Kill Giants. And this is his new OGN, Henshin. And this, I'm reading right from the w- image, the 
horrible, awful, terrible, really shitty image website. Uh, it says, I am Giants, or I Killed Giants co-creator Ken Namura, international manga award winner and Eisner nominee, brings a unique vision of life in Japan to the page in Henshin. The lives of a kid with particular, with peculiar superpowers, a lonely girl discovering herself in the big city, and a businessman on a long night out are some of the short stories included in this collection that will make you laugh and maybe even shed a tear. Explore Tokyo as you've never seen it before under Nomura's masterful and imaginative storytelling. And I'm like 100% all about that. You said all the things that I like. Ken Nomura, Tokyo, businessman. Shedding tears. tears. <laughs> One of these days, you're gonna have to bring back Project X oh, Challenger yeah. Seven Eleven. I will. Maybe I I'll actually bring, sat down and read that. Maybe I'll bring Project X Challengers Cup Noodle. <laughs> bring all of them because isn't there, there a McDonald's one too? No, there's there's only three. Uh, there's Cup Noodle Seven Eleven and the um, the Datsun Fairlady Z, the first Japanese sports car. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna have to read that Cup Noodle one. Yeah, they're all awesome. <laughs> I love business manga, <laughs> as it says on the web hosts page. Um, but yeah, this looks great. I love I Kill Giants so much. Like that art is so fluid and crazy, and like nothing I've ever seen before. And I really like it. And I'm excited to read this. And I saw it on the shelf not too long ago, and I was like, "Well, shit, I'm gonna love that." So, um, <laughs> well, shit, well, shit. <laughs> so, oh shit! So I'm bringing Henshin because I love Japan and uh, and Ken Nomura, All right. and short stories and comic books. So there we go. Brant, what would you like to read this week? Captain Marvel. Really? You sure? Yeah. Pretty oh, sure. okay. I thought about it a lot. <laughs> oh, I did? Okay. Kate? Kate? Captain Marvel. All right. Kaylee? Uh, snicked. Tobiah? I'm going to vote for Captain Marvel, even though I can promise you that I'm going to talk mad smack about the art. Boo. Don't you dare. Boo. Well, actually, this is well, the, the current second artist. Second one, you can. The current no, artist the is great. Art. The second artist in that you series, guys are all on crack. You're like I picked up, I picked so up a random issue, like right issue now. six or something like that, and I opened it, and I closed it, and I put it down, and I was like, I can't, I can't deal with this. I can't read this I, because this art just disturbs me on so many levels. I picked up that second artist and was like, finally, this book is good now. <laughs> So we will have words, sir, on the next right. episode. Look I forward look to that. forward to that uh, for a change. And <laughs> <laughs> so the first 17, is that three volumes of Captain no, Marvel? No, it's two. It's two? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll read those. So and up, up, and away, and then back down again. Yeah. No. <laughs> and then <laughs> Captain Marvel 2 Electric Boogaloo. So read those for next week. <laughs> if you're not confused, we'll wait, post wait, Chad, it on you our didn't web. vote. I don't have to vote. You have to vote. I don't have to vote. It doesn't matter what you pick. All right, you still I want to read vote. Captain Marvel. All right, oh, then. Good. good. I always vote for Captain Marvel when Kaylee brings it. Yeah. All right, then. It's good. mostly unanimous. There we I go. did the third vote and fourth, fourth and maybe the second time. About times. goddamn time. Yeah. yeah it only That's took what the name enough. of that episode is going to be. <laughs> Even the Gutters episode 105, about goddamn time. <laughs> I'll put that in parentheses. <laughs> Do it. All right. We'll see you guys next time. All right. Bye, everybody. Later. Bye. Thank you for listening to Me From The Gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title. But like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes review. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.